Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so as the chairman announced, blockchain has gone from the hype to the reality. So I'm here to tell you about another hype that sooner or probably more later gonna affect this reality. So what is happening in the field of quantum technology? Well, before telling you about future, let me tell you about the past. So maybe some of you won't remember what's happened in 1969. Uh, was one of the first step of blockchain probably when the ARPA network was initiated. So this was a very simple four node ARPA net that was trying to send single bit zero one, which is electricity up and down. And of course, using further communication and et cetera, network and internet started happening. And then it's gone beyond our imagination what you can do with internet and hence blockchain. Well, history repeats. You know, what we are seeing right now is that now, instead of sending single bits, which is zero one, now we are able to send photon or electron or anything that you, know, you can imagine that allow you to go to the microscopic level of the communication. I'm not gonna teach quantum mechanics right now, uh, but you can imagine that instead of playing with just two point of zero one, you can play with the whole point on the sphere. Let's, let's just stick to that. That's the exotic uh, object that we can do. And we actually have equivalent of the ARPANET. There is the, in the University of Delft, there is like the simplest four node quantum internet uh, blueprint being, uh, being set up that is now sending photon instead of single bits. And uh, you know, and this is expanding. Even in Europe, uh, about a couple of years ago, there was much smaller platform, which is was class called trusted node uh, communication. I'm going to lose my computer in a second. Uh, that was developed, and then there was a British one that is going to be developed, and soon between again is trusted node, etc. People can communicate between point, and surprise, surprise, Chinese have win the game. So they have managed to put the 2,000 kilometers with 300 nodes demonstrating the potential of a quantum communication network, okay? So that's what I mean by history being repeated. So what about, so keep that quantum technology, quantum information, quantum internet in picture, in mind, I'm coming back to that, but let's see what's happening with the quantum computing. We are all having a little laptop, you know, what's happening with the quantum era. Well, you know, I told you it's a hype. There is uh, lots of quantum money going around, not as much as blockchain, but you know, there has been a lot of initiative in European uh, quantum flagship, one billion. You know, UK started a couple of year, years ago, 207 million. US just announced uh, in the fear of the Chinese uh, communication network another big national program. There is a lot of investment from Google, IBM, Alibaba, lots of startup, etc. that they're showing that quantum computing is going to happen. So, you know about Moore law, we have a Moore law of quantum computer. We know when the field started, it was like a, a virtual reality. People could play with two atoms, getting together and doing this thing. Every two years it starts, you know, expanding, expanding. And you know, you know, right now, Google has put, you know, a couple of months ago, uh, a 72 qubit devices that is manipulated quantum uh, computation. 72 qubit, it means like a 72 bits computation, but the most important thing is that the number of parameter that you would have had classically to manipulate and came the same capacity will be two to the 72. Trust me why, uh, we can do the mathematics over the lunch, but the aim of this whole field and this investment and this all of these big pictures that we are now can proudly stand and saying that we will soon see a device which is beyond 100 qubits. And why that 100 qubit is such a big milestone? Because we would really have a device that is going to function and you cannot using any of your high performance computing or even the blockchain and the cloud computing server whatsoever to simulate the capacity of these devices. Okay, so this is just a milestone of the field that we would have it, you know, a couple of years ago, we would not believe in it, but that's still far, far, far from away from doing have a device that is universal quantum computer and we can all buy it or start using it and running our uh, new mm, smart contract on it. But it's just, just to giving a vision that is no longer impossible to think that these steps are going to come. So that's the status of the quantum computation. And all of these things, 
trigger this various sort of national program that they are focused in particular pillar. They're looking at the computation. They're looking at the communication. They're looking at the sensing. That's the highest URL that you know you would have devices. Maybe you will put it on your IoT that has a much better sensing capacity than the usual uh, classical devices, and they're using quantum technology as the basis of it. And then, etc., and the simulation, and it's more for you know uh, physics discovery, etc., going here. So, okay, so the vision of quantum technology. I put these two figures. These two figures on the bottom. These two are the milestones. So one of them. This is satellite. This is a communication between Shanghai and um, Vienna through quantum satellite. So there was a photon sent from uh, Shanghai to the satellite. That photon was reflected back to uh, Shanghai, and uh, no, from Shanghai to Vienna. And they established, for the first time, an unhackable, secure communication teleconferencing. So this is just really a happen, one thing that happened. You need to have a lot of billion to put such a things on the satellite, but a lot of people are mimicking. Canadian has uh, launching their own program. We don't know if US uh, have it or not, but there is, there is this also program, because it's an alternative of going global into the picture. And the other milestone, as I said, is the computing. And Google is not the only one. Intel, uh, Alibaba, lots of you know scientific uh, area is also looking at this thing. Then because of this progress on the hardware, there is the software development coming. We have client server, as I will, if I get the chance to tell you exactly the same thing, like a cloud computing, you have quantum cloud computing, et cetera. More importantly, we have verifiable quantum computing going through, and the application that it much might affect the community that we are here talking about smart contract is enhanced sensing, enhanced security, and the computational speed up. So let's dig into it to see how it's going to affect. So is quantum, I have two points I need to make. I want to show you quantum technology as a threat, but you need to bear with me to the end of my talk to show that it's not as, as scary as it might uh, looks like. So quantum computing is a threat. So the first thing is that the classical security that is the basis of all of our contract, you know, public encryption, Bitcoin, blockchain, smart contract, whatever you name it, they all against adversary that if it, they will break down if you bring a quantum uh, computer. So we know mathematically there are quantum algorithms that will be breaking down uh, the computational assumption beyond a lot of this cryptographic assumption, you know, uh, factoring discrete logarithm, uh, elliptic curve cryptography, they're the, the, the most common one used one. But it's even beyond that. So there is the quantum effect, even look at some, some deeper thing in the cryptography that there are some assumptions regarding information security when you're not taking into account the quantum adversary. That will be affected. And even more exciting than that, the classical proof technique that we usually use, the zero case, zero knowledge proof, all of this technique is saying the proof technique cannot be any more safe. So if you want to have provable security, and in the usual security model, when we're assuming you're bringing back quantum because of something called rewinding, you can not even do that. So it is going to affect the cryptography as we knew it quite uh, strongly, okay? So just, just a quick link of like factoring, discrete logarithm, elliptic curve. These are the famous crypto systems that are commonly used because they are very efficient, they are very practical. If you see the top uh, four one are having a polynomial time algorithm polynomial time quantum algorithm. We still need to have quantum computer, which we don't have it, but you know, I show you, we are somewhere in that regime that maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, maybe never, we might have it. So that already triggered the NIST competition or NIST uh, collaboration, as they like to say, that everybody come to find a solution. What are we going to do about this thing? And if you look at the one of the line that I put, the shortest lattice vector, sub-exponential, that sounds good. It seems at least so far we don't have a quantum algorithm that yet break this particular type of crypto system. So there is a solution for, for all of this threat that is called a post-quantum uh, secure classical solution. This is another set of classical function that we'll pick up rather than our factoring and RSA and et cetera that we like. It's called learning with error that is believed it's very important, remember, it is believed for time being to be secure. That what does it mean? It means that the number of mathematicians that worked to break factoring, you know, they eventually will succeed, you know, like uh, one of them was uh, Peter Shore that break them quantumly. It might be even break them classically. But the number of mathematicians who have tried to work to break this particular problem are not a lot. They are very clever people, but the number of people who work on this thing to show that whether, whether it is hard or not is limited. So 
take it with a grain of salt that whether you want to completely go with it or not, but it's the only solution we have. If you want to be somewhere that is saving you from the future, well, this is it is. There is the LW-based crypto system that allow you to even go to all of those issues that I was raising, the commitment scheme, that it might be not any more valid, et, et cetera, going, you need to build something secure against it, even the coin flipping, et cetera, that are important crypto system in the classical setting, that they will come back, so we will have something. Even more exciting is you can even bring the, some of those zero knowledge proof system, but of course, I mean, all of these things are good, but there will be challenges. There is a price for all of these things. The efficiency is severely affected. So, you know, most of the time when you ring the actual application, you don't want to have a lot of delay on this thing. The price for getting this quantum secure means that your public key is enormous. I mean, they are huge progress. You know, this is a very rapid talk saying that, you know, it's an active field, but the issue of efficiency remain to bring them to the level that you don't have a very much delay on the company that wants to provide the governance and people need to wait for a um, couple of hours to update, et cetera. There is the issue of long-lasting security, everlasting security, which is a concept that valid for RSA, but somehow for none of this post-quantum, you could have this mechanism that even if I store your key, if I store your secret, and I come back in 50 years, it's, it's too late. So most of these uh, existing solutions cannot offer you this everlasting, and depending on the application, you need to see if you want to have that one. And also, the case is that there is also, even with this post-quantum, et cetera, so you have side channel attack, which I'm not gonna talk about it, but if you have even a build a classical secure system based on this post-quantum efficient, there is very funny attack that if you give some quantum possibility, you can break some of these things. So there is a side channel attack comes. And this is, this is the game that is always there. I mean, like this is cryptographer do something, crypto analysis breaking it, and the game will go on. But, so, but just maybe to highlight this issue of the efficiency, you know, like for example, People are already talking about quantum resistance signature scheme with lattice base. You know, this, if you search on the internet, you see that there are alternative way to do signature, which is one of the essential thing for the authentication, for the various elements that you require in the blockchain. You say, okay, nice, so I, I pay the price, I go for this post-quantum one, I, I go through it, okay, it's a little bit larger. But then the real challenge is that at the same time, we want to even make the normal signature scheme smaller. It was like a couple of weeks ago, one of the pioneers of the field, Dan Bonnet, was giving a talk, in, I think, in the same room, that he was saying that we want to have different scheme that even shrink the signature size, even bring it uh, smaller and smaller. And then the moment that you want to bring more fancy crypto system, this is what I want to say. Okay, maybe if you go with the basic signature and public encryption, we might be get away with uh, this post-quantum. But if you want to bring more sophisticated multi-party scenario, bringing on top of it zero knowledge and shrinking your signature, they are no longer post-quantum. And this is again a very active field of research that in the classical crypto, people are realizing you know, there is new demand from uh, blockchain community, new demand for the crypto that you need to uh, address them. And it's not clear whether we can do, can we do also an efficient multi-party cloud-based authentication system? Well, we need to look at it. So that's about the challenge and potential solution, but I want to also finish the game with saying that quantum technology could be also an opportunity. We don't need to just look at it, okay, it's gonna break it down and let's see when it's coming and I calculate it, okay, so I will come up with the best classical solution and then I can forget about quantum. I'm afraid not, you cannot forget about quantum. So the point is, that the quantum can also give a new solution for your cryptography system. I mean, some of you might have heard about them in quantum key distribution, which was basis of this large QKD network in China, that essentially, if I now am happy to open my mind and allow them my communication not to be just zero one in my digital part, but to be a bit superposition of zero one and photon, everything that is implementable, that you have a security is no longer based on some mathematician are not clever enough to break my system. It's because on the fact that Physicists have been clever enough to show that quantum mechanic has been correct for 200 years. So as long as the laws of quantum physics is correct, which we strongly believe it is the case because we have done many experiments to show that, then we have this unconditionally, well, there's lots of information around this. It's not really unconditional, but much stronger security that you can have. And the basic concept that is important to say that why this is an opportunity is that 
unlike the classical world, the leak, uh, the eavesdropping, trying to somebody interfere and you know messing around your photon wire rather than the class. Nobody can eavesdrop because eavesdropping in quantum mechanics will affect your information. So if I'm sending a quantum information to you, somebody can mess it up. I will know it. So you're never ever going to use. The property of this thing is that you're never going to use something that is break, is unhackable, those things. And this is not just about key distribution. I just like quickly go to list of this because I know I'm standing between you and your lunch that there is a lot of primitive. It's not just key distribution. If you look at it, there is, it's field started almost 30 years ago, 40 years ago by quantum money, but they could not publish it because the field was not even defined. But the key distribution, secret sharing, bit commitment, oblivious transfer, digital signature, etc. You see that these are all the few primitive that is popping up when you dig into the, the lower layer of the smart contract. So there are solutions, and not all of them are perfect. It's like, oh, we're going to replace information security and everything is perfect. They are just giving you a little bit enhancement. Some of them give you better bias. Some of them give you alternative, maybe infrastructure secure. So each time you need to go through it. I can I get jump, you get the idea of this thing. And it's also just another thing I wanted to show about the example about the cloud computing, that it can be also be secure, but I think my chairman trying to put pressure on me. So I need to go through it, but we can do a perfect cloud. It's very good cloud, it's secure, privacy address, quantum uh, is verifiable, but as usual, there is a price of it, you know, how you can do it. So. So there is, there is what I say, a lot of this thing, as I say, why this is hype and it's coming in the future, is that most of them are in theory level, you know. It's good thing to say that one satellite has been, it's good to say that one, you know, quantum computer is built, but is it really going to be adopted? Can we really start plug and play, doing all of this thing together? We believe we can. We have a startup company, the CEO, Mark Kaplan, can, can tell you more about it. But of course, these are very, very early stage of the development. There is another people who also believe this is correct, which is the European Union, uh, not European Union, European funding, uh, who have uh, announced just recently the Quantum Internet Alliance that I encourage you to look at the website. It's a you know, three years program to allow us to develop all the hardware, software, plug and play application, et cetera, that goes together to allow us to do this thing. There is a community of practice and observe them, that we would be very happy to have people from blockchain to come to tell us about it. Again, you know, so just to put two point together, it would be very nice if we can show that this unconditionally secure peer-to-peer -peer quantum network that we are aiming to build by adding a little bit of post-quantum and quantum crypto primitive might give you an alternative way of building your smart contract, maybe. And I just want to finish by saying that, of course, there is a price of trust, you know, not everything comes for free. You need to look at the particular application, the timeline, what do, when do you want to be uh, worried about the security to see that whether you want to go, even, even want to go to the post-quantum. You know, I said there is a NIST competition, but in ANSI here announced that actually we don't believe in post-quantum. It's too soon to be worried about quantum, and it's too soon to put some of this post-quantum as uh, integrated in our system. So we just wait and see. So there is very alternative way of looking at should I go to post-quantum? Well, let's see what's happening with the quantum development. But these are the questions that you need to keep. So that's one issue. There is an issue of like how much security you want, how much you're happy to pay for this. You know, okay, there is nice, there's all these goodies in the quantum internet protocol that you can pick up. But well, the infrastructure is not cheap. You need to also look at this infrastructure to be implemented. And eventually, there is also alternative way of to trust minimizing. A lot of discussion today we had is like, you know, can we somehow minimize the trust uh, assumption as a result the necessity of going post quantum will be minimized and hence maybe time to time we can pay the cost so there is a lot of new trade off and economy of this thing need to be looked at by by that i just finished thank you very much <laughs> Uh, all interventions were, were so interesting and so prospective. Maybe we have uh, one or two minutes if some of you want to ask questions or... Uh, this is a question for the lawyers in the room. So you said that uh, economical contracts are very complex. So I build my argument on the fact that um, maybe there is the possibility to split an economical contract in several parts. One part that can be expressed in uh, if condition then action, which is more Boolean, 
another part that can be expressed in a fuzzy logic, and the third part that I cannot express it mathematically. Okay, so uh, my my point here is that computer science evolved from the time when three uh, engineers coded windows in their garage. So now in computer science, we know how to um, construct, how to generate automatically uh, correct code, starting with, uh, with uh, something that is expressed in natural language. So there are already tools that generate this. For instance, you took the plane, maybe this morning or yesterday, so you may know that the plane has uh, so a part of the of the trip was under automatic control, which was generated automatically. So so my point here is that in case my assumption is true, so you just need to uh, to to use what has been done recently in computer science and uh, trust. Uh, tools that have been designed and proved and certified. So if I have the chain that goes from the natural language to the code, I have also the chain that goes back from the code to the natural language that can be certified and you can trust it. So this is just one point. which is great news and <laughs> if I were in the business of drafting contracts <laughs> I would be <laughs> a bit concerned <laughs> no, in, in the sense that uh, it, well it, it, it can uh, make the well it, it's um, uh, a gain of productivity f from a certain point of view because it means that many uh, tasks can be performed almost automatically, uh, which is, I think, what is going on in the legal area. Smart contracts are one example, but predictive justice is another example and so on. Um, so yeah, it, you, you would still need at this stage probably someone who can make sure that the translation is okay, or two people, maybe uh, a computer scientist and a, and a lawyer. Um, but uh, yeah, th that sounds very promising. Yeah, no, I think we uh, we you can trust the the code, uh, uh, but uh, is the complex complexity of uh, some legal arrangements and the legal re reality. Um, uh, possible to to be coded at the moment. Th this this was my ma main concern, and uh, and I don't have an answer. But uh, this is part. Uh, uh, you have part of the answer, uh, apparently. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the the uh, hard part here is to determine. Um, an interpretation, you know, ask a computer, even though you have natural language processing, asking a computer what is good faith or uh, what is, you know, part of a sentient experience, uh, that's the really, really hard part. And so one, one solution here is to leave within the code um, fields of liberty or fields of interpretation to be uh, filled by actual, um, like, uh, human judges or lawyers or etc. So, yeah. Okay, we want to. Hi, I have a question for the physicist too, actually. So, uh, on I'm a the computer scientist. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's perfect, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, Scott Aronson, uh, who you know as well, he recently wrote on his. He's a. He's a quantum guy as well, he um, said on his blog, the compared to, if you compare quantum computing to nuclear weapons, um, the deterrent effect of a nuclear weapon happens when you have it as a state and everybody knows it, so you had never have to use it. With a quantum computer, the advantage is having it and nobody knows it. So how can we be sure that 
you know, we're not actually already post-quantum, so to speak. And second question, um, the whole reason why we have blockchain in the first place is because of the um, copyability of digital information and as a solution to the double spending problem. Now I understand that in quantum theory we have this idea of no cloning, so I'm wondering will we replace the blockchain with quantum money soon or maybe when we have, maybe at the same time when we have those 100 qubit computers. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So regarding quantum computer have it or not is, is a hard question, it's an assumption. You know, we're always saying it as a joke, but it, I think the reality of it is, is that you know, this particular breaking Shor's algorithm and hence breaking RSA is a suicide type of application of quantum computer. So if you have it, you break it and then nobody use RSA. So I, th I think my uh, optimistic way of viewing is that once people have quantum computer, there is much more interest in terms of services that he can provide, et cetera, that when people will be very happily announce it. You know, they will announce it because it's a new service. And within that picture, that's why people are already moved from this elliptic curve, et cetera, RSA. So I think this is it is, but you know, nobody knows you know, the picture why, uh, what it was. And regarding quantum money, as you say, that it, indeed there is a possibility of unforgeability despite the no cloning and there is an alternative. But they, all of this thing comes from the fact of this price of trust that I said. Indeed, we have demonstrated in our lab that quantum money is possible. You can have this unforgeable you know, credit card, et cetera, which is uh, surviving for five nanoseconds because photon is very uh, fragile. So you don't have really this credit card for a long time. Nobody will break it, but you cannot also using it. So there is a, but a solution for it is the um, memory development, and then, then people are working on it. So that's why I mentioned that it's really a matter of timing. And you know, there are companies who are particularly working on the uh, memory because they know that once the memory comes, you put the plug and things together and then there is an application. And there is, there is issue of the timing. You know, that's why we are, not, we are still on the hype and it's not clear you know, this hype gonna continue being hype, it's coming down. But my point that I'm hoping everybody takes here is like, there are a lot of development, both on the theory and application and the development and the hardware that has made it that is now it, it's no longer possible to ignore it and say this is just an academic topic that is sitting there. It, we are not there to really put a solution in front of the industry and uh, everybody to say, it, come and take this one. But there is uh, an area to watch, to look at, to see what will emerge out of it. Well. So I have a follow up on, on this because I think you kind of brushed away the second question. So. So classical blockchain is uh, essentially a state machine replication algorithm, so a kind of error correcting code. And you also have quantum error, error correcting codes. So do you think you can have a completely quantum concept of consensus? I would say yes on paper. And I would be able to also say that, okay, so having it on the paper and writing a con quantum consensus protocol exists. And then the important question is that how much advantage that quantum consensus will have that I can go and convince people to invest in doing this. And I would say right now, this advantage in terms of like a threshold of security that you would have in the quantum consensus versus classical consensus, maybe is not yet. I mean, to be really convincing that, okay, let's, let's build a new fiber optics connecting everybody and everybody sends satellite up to, to really improve the consensus by the few parameters. So we, what I mentioned is like, you know, you need to have much more clear advance and enhancement that is arguing that we, we need to go, uh, to, go to, to for it, so. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will now hand this uh, second panel. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, thanks again for all your presentation.